Oh wait, uh, is your camera like this thing? There's something that keeps going down. Is that is the mic? Uh, where is it exactly? On the top, it appears right there on the screen. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I see that thing. Oh no, it's good. That's oh, good. Okay, we're walking, rolling. Welcome to the Johnny I Pro Show. I have no other than right here, the bruiser, Ryan Riziki, ranked number one WBC. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Not going to say, congrats on number one, Ryan, WBC. How does that make you feel? Who's the champion? Exactly. <laughs> exactly, who's the yeah, champion? Yeah. Now, all that hard work and dedication just to get number one. So your goal is obviously to become the champ. That's it, yeah. That's the best right. in the world. I'm right there now. One more guy to, one more guy to get to Saturday. Exactly. Now, I've got to say now, the WBC Final Eliminator is this Saturday, correct? Yep. From, obviously, Nova Scotia, your hometown. It's going to be in Sydney against Durodola. Yep. Now, how does that similar styles of you and him, like, just go together? How do you think this fight's going to plan out? I think it's going to be over quick. I think, sure. I think the fight's going to be over maybe the first round. There you go. And, obviously, you're on a six-win win streak, correct? Yeah. And he's on a seven-win win streak. So, it's, like, right there. So, potentially, if you do win, you see a title shot March, I'm guessing? Uh, that's what they're saying, Mark. That's yeah. what they're saying. Yeah. Okay, so here we go. And his record is what? I think 42 and 9? Uh, 43 and 9, 40 knockouts. Wow. Yeah. Wow, that's quite... That's, that's a puncher. Yeah. That's, so through, the, like, through this whole training camp and stuff, how's the training camp going so far? Um, I've Honestly, like, for me, it's I train 365 days a year. There's no really training camp for me. It's just yeah. I stay ready all the time. Um, but I've, I've been in the gym now since the beginning of summer. So I've been going hard since the beginning of summer. I had two fights. Uh, including a North American title fight. So, like, I'm ready as I could ever be. So it's non-stop go for you. Yeah. Now, like, the matchup and stuff as well, like, is there, like, do you think it's going to be, like, is it a perfect matchup for you, like, similar styles? How does the styles of both you guys? Absolutely, because, uh, number one, he's a little older, so his legs are, you know, father time, you can't you can't beat father time. So the first thing to go in a fighter is the legs. Yes. Everybody knows that. The, look at Muhammad Ali, for example. Sugar Ray Robinson's a good example. So... Movers usually are the first guys to slow down, but that's not what Duradol is. He's a plant his feet, come forward kind of guy. So I don't really got to worry about him not being there to hit. He's going to be there to hit, and that's why I'm saying first round. And now this is a homecoming for you, basically. It's such a huge fight. Now, how does it feel like, uh, is there pressure for you going home and fighting at home? I mean, there's, yeah, there's, there's always going to be a little pressure at home, um, but hey, what, what better... What better place to kill or kill a man or be killed than right your own there, backyard. Right your backyard. <laughs> exactly. Right me there. Exactly. Now your now your last fight was versus Green. Versus Green, like how was that? Were you happy with your performance? I mean, yeah, I I was, but like I obviously I got hit quite a bit in that fight. I uh, I didn't really I wasn't boxing as much as I could have been because I, I really wanted to kill that man. I <laughs> he said some things before the fight and it bothered me, it really got to me. So, you know, my whole thing in that fight was just like murder the guy and and uh i kind of neglected my boxing skills because i was so focused on just you know punishing him and and, and just walking through him that I, I got hit a little bit too much so this fight i'm going to uh try to sit back a little more and even though i'm still going to try to knock him out in the first round i'm going to try to do it a little bit more like strategically exactly in style i gotta say now previously as well as gym and stuff you show me i want to talk about this because i was just in a maze you obviously showed me a clip. It was against uh, somebody from Slovakia, a fighter, mm -hmm. and so like explain to him and stuff because like people love hearing this story. Like especially, I think you told me like you hit him with a left and right, like broke his ribs and stuff. Can you explain that story to people that know? Because this is quite interesting. This is crazy. Yeah, that was my uh, third professional fight, so it was the first one. It was actually the first big fight in Cape Breton in like forty years. So wow. that that was um that was the first professional fight card there in years. So I was headlining it. And uh, they wanted to bring in a pretty good or solid opponent for me. They didn't want to bring in any pushover. So I fought the uh, champion the champion of Slovakia. Wow. I can't remember his record, but he's a good fighter. And uh, I studied him leading up to the fight, and I noticed uh, that he liked to leave his elbows real high. He was a mover. Moved left and right and kind of left his elbows up high. So I, I knew as soon as I jabbed him to the body, he would have to stop. And when I saw them, it came in the first round, and I saw the moment, and I, I jabbed his body, and he stopped. And I just, everything I had, I threw the right hand to the body and left hook to the body. And the, the right hook uh, split his spleen. It like ripped it into two. 
and then the left hook fractured four ribs and they punctured his lung. So he like is the fight was over immediately. So it's done. Done and, and uh, his him and his his team they only spoke his language. So after the fight was over, they were trying to explain to the commissioner and the ringside doctors if there was something wrong with the, the fighter. Because I think immediately he was like bleeding out of his mouth. It was coming from the inside. Like internal bleeding. Internal That's bleeding. That's crazy. Yeah, so um, they were going to send him on the flight back home the next morning. And he ended up missing his flight. And uh, they, they, there was something wrong with the guy. So they, they finally got him to the hospital and found out that his, his organs were pretty much destroyed. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. So they call you Bruiser for a reason. Yeah. Is there any like, what is your most memorable fight to date? Um, I think, I mean, the great, the last fight was was one of them for yeah. sure. Laid him out. Yeah, I had I had a lot a lot of great fights. I had the fight against Oscar Rivas for the world championship. That was you know that was yeah that was really heavy duty fight for sure. That was a crazy fight. I gave up pretty much every advantage I could in that fight, but still, and you know, I walked out with a career ahead. I mean, he he never fought again. Wow, but that man that sure did put your name on a pedestal for sure yeah. that was like a slugfest 100% he's one of my favorite fighters to this day he's, he's on my list of like one of my favorite fighters and you, and you get to fight like basically one of your favorites that's like yeah. a surreal moment for sure yeah. now your prediction for Saturday you're predicting a first uh, first round knockout Yeah. that's how hungry you are for that for sure I guess, you know, let's bring it right now to people love when they see this, the modern day Jack Dempsey, as you call yourself everybody knows it obviously as you showed yourself like what are your similar styles to you and Jack Dempsey do you see uh, like he, he was the you know the first boxer that I ever actually watched uh, on tape fight, and when I saw him right away, like I kind of got creeped out because like he kind of looks like me. His head is shaped like mine. It, he's built similar. We have the same stats, height, weight, everything. So it was it was kind of weird. And then the way he moved, like naturally, when I started boxing, I, I moved the same way naturally. I got low in my legs. I like to bob bob and weave with my head, come up with the left hook. So like everything that he did, I just kind of did it naturally. So I just kind of like. Try to emulate his style right from the right from the gate, and then not only that, but but the mindset. Like Dempsey, if you read his book or you know killer. anything about him, he's a killer. Yeah. He, he he always talks about that in, in his books, and you know he actually had a circus act a lot of people don't know about, oh. and like and he had said I, I read this or I can't remember if I read it or someone had told me, but um, yeah, the, his circus act was he, he basically boxed with guys off the street, and the, and the thing was was if they could last a minute with him. He, they would get like a thousand dollars and somebody had interviewed him I just can't remember where I read this but someone had interviewed him about it like his circus act this was when he was heavyweight so, champion of the world so, oh. and it was like he was more disappointed if he couldn't break their skull inside of a minute than he would be if he had to give them a thousand dollars no way what a mentality that's the kind of guy he was so you know to the public he was known as a gentleman bore dressed up nice shake everybody's hands you know do um, stuff with the kids and you know like a people person yeah. but I know once it goes was. in that, once it goes fight time, it's it's yeah. kill or be killed. Wow, yeah. I was gonna say, no, I I also seen as well. I remember once I also seen as well. You post and you show me like that similarities that photo. I think it was like you were like doing. I think it was like a right or left hook, and the same similar hook that he was doing was like right on point. Yeah, yeah. It's just like it's just crazy to see that. Now, like, what what does he like say? What does Jack mean to you? I think he's a the guy. I don't know, sound crazy, but I believe that. And, and I also read this somewhere so that there's an old like saying in the, in the war. I don't know if it was like samurais who believed in it, but there were some type of warriors who believed that every 100 years, like a great warrior or gladiator's soul is like almost like passed on or reincarnated. So to, to the day, like the pictures that I showed you was exactly yeah, it was, it was like similar. Yeah. yeah, exactly 100 <laughs> years apart. And like, I believe that like whatever his, I don't think I'm like, not necessarily a reincarnation, but I think that his fighting soul just was, yeah, to you. Yeah, yeah, because I because I'm, I'm I'm constantly bringing his name up, you know. I'm trying to fight like him, and I'm trying to do everything the way he did it. So I think if if the like when people die, their energy whatever it goes, I think somehow I got a hold. Hundred percent. Yeah, you got it for sure. I was gonna say, what are you? What is his favorite? Like uh, his favorite fight that you ever watched? That uh, stands out. Probably the Jess Willard fight. Yeah, that was to to, to this day it's the most brutal uh, beating in boxing history. Like. He, he broke his jaw, his eye socket, knocked out six teeth, broke his rib. And like back then, there was no neutral knock knockdown corner rule. So you knock a guy down, you didn't have to go to the neutral corner. Actually, they made that rule because of Jack Dempsey. Cause he, wow. cause like, but before him, boxing was a gentleman's sport. You see like the fighters of this, these old eras, you know, they got the reduced yeah, like yeah. stuff. Yeah. And it was a very like, it was a, a respected sport. So fighters would, they would fight. And like if somebody got knocked down, they would take a step back and they would, out of respect, they let the other man back to his feet. 
referee would say box and they would go. But that wasn't a rule. Yeah. Technically, they didn't have to do that. Yeah. So when Dempsey came into the scene, it was the first time the world had seen a fighter not care about this guy. Like, he, he literally would hit him, and he would drop him, and he would stand over him. He would actually go around to his back. So when the guy got up, he hit him from behind. Yeah, oh, wow. Like, there's, there's no, like, it's kill or be killed. Exactly. There's, there's no going around it. No. <laughs> and and I, that's why I love that fight, because he really showed the world, like, what it means to be, like, a ruthless fighter. And, you know, you respect the guy before the fight, shake his hand before the fight, after the fight, but during the fight, like, it's, it's like, no. Man, it's better his mother cries than my mom. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Could have said it better. Now, you recently were in New York as well for his 100th anniversary versus, uh, was it Furbo, I believe? Yeah. How was that whole, like, New York City vibe? One there, especially for Jack Dempsey? I mean, it was pretty cool. Like, um, I really felt like uh, he was with me everywhere I went. Like, the, everybody was talking about him. I ended up, like, being going to his, uh, not his original restaurant, but the one that they named after him since in New York City. Shut down. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. They just took the P out of his name, but it's it's still named after him. Um, you know, got got to uh, talk to a lot of people who like personally knew him, like uh, Joe Diamond and Don Majeski. Like, you know, we, legends. Legends. They told so many stories about him, and and uh, Mauricio Solomon himself actually asked if he could call me Jack. So that's what he calls me. He Incredible. Call me Incredible. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. But it was pretty cool. Does he have like uh, kids and stuff? Jack Dempsey and stuff? Actually, I'm, I'm, I've talked to his grandson quite a bit. I was going to say Josh Dempsey. Yeah, he, wow. he owns a gym in uh, Miami called, uh, I think it's Dempsey's Lions. You ever go there? No, but I'm I got to go. For I'm, sure. I'm going. Since you go with the straps, you got to go there for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Oh, 100%. He, he's been following my career actually before I even knew who he was. What? Yeah, that, that's that. just in, that's incredible. Holy. Now I can ask him, what got you into boxing? Um, for, for me, it was a uh, guy who's. I was just, a, I grew up in a fighting family, so I was, I was always involved in street fights, and then uh, once, once I got to around ages like 14, 15, that was when I started, like, they started going from, like, giving people black eyes and bloody noses in fights, or getting a tooth knocked out to, like, I would, like, break people's jaws, and, like, it, was, like, it got bad, so I started getting, like, charged by the police, getting locked up, and I think it was, like, my third, um, my third assault charge, it was, like, assault causing bodily harm, and, uh, I had like an option to, I think it was part of one part of my conditions, you know, you get like probation sentence. One of my conditions was to join a sport. It was either like complete uh, restorative justice and, and do the conditions and basically stay out of trouble for 12 months or I was going to go to like juvie. And so obviously I went with the probation and I had to join a sport as part of the conditions. So I'm allowed to join hockey. My dad's like, well, you're just going to get kicked out of hockey. Like you're going to be you know, slow there to start fighting. Sure. So he put me in a, a local boxing club, and then like as soon as I started boxing, like fell in love. Yeah, I sucked at it to be honest. Like I couldn't. I, even to this day, I'm not that great of a boxer. I just kind of like slug it out. But um, I love one for a reason. That's for sure. Yeah, no <laughs> yeah. one for a reason. I say, what was your like your first pro fight? It was 2016. Yeah. Yeah, and like the whole the whole like uh, like the whole story behind it. I also heard as well like your dad was like basically busking for like well he was doing music and stuff yeah. and to like basically pay for your first fight. Like that yeah. story is just incredible when I heard. Can you let us know yeah. a little bit about that story? Well, there? he didn't. So he didn't pay for the first fight. That was actually uh, so that my first fight. Uh, I, I had uh, sparred with a, a, a local maritime fighter, Brandon Brewer, who he was a professional at the time. I think he was like sixteen and all or something. So he he was uh, putting on a fight card. He also promotes his own shows. So he was putting on a fight card in Fredericton, and he had come down to Cape Breton to get some sparring in before he fought. He fights the main event on it, right? And uh, he, he ended, I ended up being at the gym, and I sparred with him, and he, he felt my power. And Can't imagine. He, 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 don't get me wrong, he outboxed me at the time, but like, he, uh, he felt my power in a great way. For sure. he, he started asking, he's like, what's your plans here? And I was like, oh, I don't know, I'm just trying to, I was fighting the amateur at the time, and I was losing more than I was winning. And then uh, he was like, well, if you ever decide to turn pro, let me know, and I'll put you on the undercard of one of my fights. And I, I was like, okay, let's do it. Let's do it, yeah. Yeah, so... Um, but no cruiserweights would fight me because I was an unknown. But they, what they did know was that I could punch my power. So I ended up getting matched against um, a heavyweight. He was like 265, something like that. Yeah, and I fought, I fought him. I fought him for like 500 bucks. And, uh, oh. I knocked him out in the third round. And then like I just I just kept fighting in the Maritimes on whatever fight card was coming up. And I usually fight heavyweights. And then... Uh, yeah, my, but my dad, we got an opportunity to fight on the Three Lions show in uh, Hamilton. Wow. But their their card was full. So they, like, I, my was like, my dad was like, well, what if we buy him on the card? Yeah. Just pay for our own slot, right? So you guys don't got to pay him. 
and then but we needed to come up with the money of course and like those who know Cape Breton it's a very poor place nobody really has any money there so uh, my dad was like kind of at the time singing playing guitar in the bar so at the end of every gig he would ask the crowd if anybody could chip in his son's gonna be the next world champion yeah. and they ended up like he ended up raising like three grand or something bought my opponent bought my flights got me there and then uh, when I got there I told I, I told uh, Dan and the boys I was like as soon as you guys see me fight you're gonna offer me a contract and then sure enough, there you go and then now you're here yeah. wow that's, that's like your dad's like the real MVP basically yeah, so wow so what, what was your first uh, amateur fight like when was that how, uh, how old were you I think I was 15 so I, I had um, like I said I started boxing uh, I think it was about 15 years old and uh, I was fighting amateur I only had two amateur fights but I was still street fighting like you could you could keep me as yeah, trouble, no way, yeah. you know and and at, and at that time I was like damn now that I know how to box a little bit I want to fight even more in the street I used to actually have this like red Sydney boxing club jacket and I used to carry on my mouth guard so, so you're like ready to go at any always time. and I, I just, <laughs> as soon as it's up would break out I'd put my mouthpiece in I'm like okay I'm gonna work on my boxing yeah now. right in the street wow that's this yeah, is crazy but that that ended up getting me in more trouble I just get charged again and then uh, I I ended up like charged again and again and like my uh, boxing coach was a correctional officer and he knew what was going on like I come into the gym every weekend with a black eye yeah, with stitches like, what's going and, on? and he's like man you gotta stay out like you guys he's like you can actually do something in boxing just stop coming here with like beat up getting in yeah, the street the fights yeah I didn't listen and then eventually he had no choice but to uh, suspend me from boxing so I got my amateur license pulled for two years so I didn't I couldn't box from ages like 15 to 17 and uh, I got my, my license pulled, and during those two years, I went from like 160 pounds to 200 pounds, and had about 200 street fights in the process. Oh, so when I, when I came back to boxing at 17, I was still amateur, uh, I started fighting all the super heavyweights around uh, Nova Scotia and in Kasai, Canada, and I started like knocking people out. And then, yeah, that, that was like my amateur career. But then once, um, once I started fighting like the elites of Canada, then I started to lose. Because my brawling style just didn't, it didn't match up for the amateur style, yeah. right? So it's like different, like more professional, like they're like. Yeah, like I fought like I fought like a street fighter. Even if you watch my first, you know, thirteen pro fights, I never threw a jab. Like everything was just, I was come forward and throw bombs and knock them out. Like I'm a thirteen and zero with thirteen knockouts in my first thirteen. What do you think really fights. switched around for you? You think it's Stevie and like it's training? Hundred yeah. percent of Stevie, yeah. Hundred percent of Stevie. If, if I never. If I never started getting trained by Stevie, like I would probably be like a 50-50 fighter right now. But now you're complete. I'm getting there. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I'm getting there. <laughs> but let's say, like, who's your toughest opponent to date? If you could think of someone that you fought throughout, not even your amateurs, like pro. You know, I, I, it's, I'll, you'd, you'd like to say Rebus because that was yeah, such a that was a slugfest. It was a slugfest. But the, my toughest opponent would have actually been. Sounds weird because it only went two rounds. I knocked him out, but uh, it was a guy named Kateg Plia. He was uh, from Dagestan, Russia, and it was my 11th pro fight, I think, and he was 5-0 and undefeated as a boxer, but we didn't know much about him, and like a week before the fight, I started finding stuff out about this guy. Number one, he's from Dagestan. Yeah, so it's like, all no, you do is fight probably, yes, for sure. Number two, Anderson Silva, um, Junior Dos Santos, the Nogueira brothers, all had hired him to be in camp to train with him. And I was like, why are they hiring yeah, why they something, something spent, like something's going on, yeah. Then I started finding out he was undefeated in kickboxing. He was on the Russian uh, Olympic wrestling team for 15 years, team captain. What? He was... Um, elite. Elite, and he had knocked, he was knocking out dudes in bo like high, high-level professional boxers. He was sparring them and knocking everybody out. So no one, so like it was, it was a fight early in my career that was supposed to be a stepping stone fight for me. No, it was, it was like, a tough one. They, I can remember, I'll never forget. Like, I mean, you can find the fight on YouTube. It's, it's on YouTube. And uh, the first round, the first punch he threw at me, it was the hardest punch I've ever been hit with in my life. You're like wake up call. Like, oh, buddy, like, <laughs> I've, been, I've been hit with just about anything you can imagine in a street fight. Like, I've been hit with baseball bats, crowbars. People hit me with everything. But that right there. <laughs> this dude hit me harder than anybody ever hit me. And he broke, um, that's why this, I got half an eyebrow missing here. And from that fight? From that fight, he, he hit me so hard that my whole orbital bone just shattered. Like every time I blinked in the fight, I thought there was gravel. When did that happen? Like the first round or when did that? Uh, that happened at the, the beginning of the second round. So, the, so early? The, the first round was like, it was just kind of like we were feeling each other a little bit. And then the second round, he opened up, crushed my eye socket, opened a cut up over my knee, like 30 some stitches inside and out. 
and I went completely blind on this side, and then the blood was going into this side too, so I couldn't really see. All I could see was like, like shadows and stuff. But um, I was, I could hear my coach was just scre Stevie screaming, like, "You got to knock him out now! If you got it in you, do it now!" Right? Yeah, exactly. But, but this guy's coming to kill me because yeah. he's, he's, he's seen his chance to take an undefeated fighter out. Yeah. So he's coming at me, and, and I remember just like, boom! Like that was the first time that uh, the the bruiser. Ever came out. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's like time to unleash him now. I did, and it was just a blur from there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. incredible. Yeah. Now, I was going to say, now, just all that right there, too, is, as well, just shows your character. Like, what separates you now from other fighters? Number one, that. That, yeah. That's, that's right there. Yeah. It, uh, it came out in the green fight, too. You know, it came out in the Rebus fight. Um, I had another fight against uh, former Canadian champion, Silvera Lewis. Like, this is something I have that, that I was, I don't know if I was born with it or if it came from. Being in so many like kill or be killed moments in streaks, a um, couple couple times in street fights like er, early on in life, um, I was in like situations where if, if I didn't fight back, the, these dudes were gonna kill me, right? Like yeah. I remember being on the pavement, getting my head stomped, and I'm like, if I don't find a way up, like um, these guys are gonna kill me. So I think it like uh, triggered some sort of like this ability to like use my rage to just like get, get up, yeah, yeah, just get up, and, and it, it comes out in boxing fights sometimes. But the problem with that is, like, um, I had one fight against a guy from Argentina who's just, like, an elite, elite, skilled boxer who, you know, the, it didn't work because he wasn't there. Like, if you're going to stand in front of me, yeah. and if I snap, the fight's over. Done, yeah. I don't care who you are, the, the, you're not dealing with it. But if, you, but if I snap and, like, these guys stay away from me, then they can, they can actually use my rage against me. You know what I mean? Because they're, they're trying, like they're getting, they're just pacing, they're getting way back, basically. Yeah, like if, like if you're not there to hit and I can't hit you, then it's going to be tough for me. But if anybody goes like toe to toe with me and then I lose my pool, it's like it's a wrap. It's a wrap. I'm telling <laughs> you. Like, and normally in, in boxing, like anger just makes you make mistakes, it makes you uh, vulnerable, get knocked out. But uh, not me. No, I'm for no. sure. I'll say, how was your training fight for this fight against Duradola on Sar on Saturday? Like. It's listen. It's like uh, one of those fights where if I do everything correct, I'm gonna knock him out in the first round. I know it. Like if if, if I uh, stick to the game plan and uh, pick my shots carefully, he's not taking it. And if I snap and you know we go toe to toe, don't get me wrong. There's he can punch, so there's a chance he could clip me and knock me out. Like I'm not. I'm still a human being. Like I hit on the chin the right way. I'm gonna go to sleep too. But I believe nine times out of ten, if I snap and he stands toe to toe with me, then either way the fight's over in the first round. Yeah, guys, you better watch down Saturday. It's gonna be a hell of a fight. Now I'm gonna say, now we, let's bring it back to you. Said Steve Bailey. What does Steve Bailey mean to you? Uh, you know, he's a, he's to me, he's like a, he's not just a coach. He's like a like a brother, like a, in a way like a father figure, like a a mentor, fucking psychologist. Yeah, so you, you can talk about anything. <laughs> yeah, like like this this stuff I talk about the rage and all yeah. that like. This guy knows how to talk to me. He knows what to say to like. I come into the gym like I, I have to apologize to everybody after fights because um, they're in like fight week. I don't mean to, but like I'm very like quick tempered. Yeah. So like little things can set me off. If you ask me like why you why you got your hand that's that color, I'm like well, Snap. what does it matter? Like well, I'm fighting to death on Saturday. Yeah. Who cares with my freaking hand wrap? Yeah. You know what I mean? So like <laughs> so Stevie will like take me like. Kind of take him to the other side of the gym and we'll and talk, talk it out, yeah. talk through it, and he, and he he just knows like he won't tell me, you know, you can't be like this. He, he like he'll he'll work with it. He yeah, knows exactly. how to like how to guide it to the right place. This emotions, these, you know, this rage that I have, like he'll just guide it into the right place. Cause we're losing it Saturday, so you know. And he's more than that, more than the coach for sure. I gotta say, like he speaks highly of you whenever we speak and stuff. Like very highly of you. Like he obviously thinks of like. That you're obviously the, not even the next big thing. Like you are, like right now, the best. And he speaks very highly of you. Yeah, he, and he obviously uh, even he was telling me today, like you have to start believing that you're one of the best fighters, if not the best fighter in the world. And I'm like, that's you, crazy bastard. Like, yeah, I can't, like you can't you get know, more motivated than that. I'm like, come sure. on, buddy. I'm I'm uh, I'm good, but I don't know about that. Like, yeah, I, I get I'm a good fighter, but that's but people that's see crazy, hey, you're number one for a reason. I mean, yeah, but, but to me, you know, it's still just a number on paper, yeah. and, and I believe that any any fighter on any given night can can beat any other fighter on any given night. You know what I mean? Like anything's possible once you're in there. Dirt all might like, knock me out in the first round. Like it's it's a possibility. Oh no, it's not. <laughs> you know, but it might happen, and, and like 
I didn't believe it. You get the like a lot of fighters. The problem with with uh, with fighters is they get delusional. They start to believe their own hype. They they start to listen to the media too much. They start to watch their own videos on Instagram too much, because you don't forget this stuff is all chopped up and edited. Like, of course, you know what I mean. The best ten seconds out of like that whole hour. Yeah, sure. it's not real. It's not real. All this stuff you're watching is not real. So it's yeah. like, um, you know, it's it's one punch in the chin. You you could come across right now and hit me in the chin. You hit me in the right spot at the right time, buddy. Over. It's this this reality. Like, yeah, exactly. I've seen the toughest guys in the streets get knocked out by nobody's drunk in a bar. Just one, just right spot, right time. It happens. So you, you can't you can't get too high on yourself. You can't think you're you're better than anybody because, like I said, on any given night, the upsets happen. Yeah. I'm gonna say now, like so now we're gonna still bring in with the West End, the gym itself, the facility, obviously top tier. But how about the team? You have like Ryan Riz. I mean, sorry, you have uh, Josh Wagner. You have Lucas Body. You just have like the whole cast there. Like I called the Avengers because everybody's so good. Like Steve Rolls. Like how is it like fighting and training with those guys? Yeah, it's great. Like being surrounded with people who are, uh, you know, they're they're also trying to be the best they can be, and they're all everybody's got a goal here. Exactly. You know? um, whether it be trying to become a world champion or just trying to you know make some money at it, but everybody's a fighter in there. And you can't take that from them. Nobody's great. Like I don't, I don't think anybody's better than anyone else. You know, if somebody, if somebody would say because I I got a number one ranking that I'm better than uh, Jake or I'm better than like I'll put them right on their spot. No, that's not how it works. We're all just fighters trying to make a living. Exactly. Can I say a bit of there? Now, if it's not training, like what do you like? What what does Ryan like to do on his spare time? Uh, hunt. <laughs> yeah, like I'm, I cannot wait to get home to get some hunting in. That's like your passion. Yeah, I freaking love it. I just like to eat what I kill and <laughs> kill what I eat. <laughs> exactly, like you say, eating there. Like, how important is nutrition and diet for you? Uh, it's huge. Like for me, I, I try to. I stay like. I don't even diet really. It's a lifestyle. All year round, I'm, I'm eating healthy. Like yeah, at time I'll eat uh, chicken wings or something, but like very rarely. And, and if I'm home, I'm only eating what I kill. Exactly. But not in Toronto because I'm not going to eat the pure Toronto. Yeah. <laughs> no offense, but I don't know what the pure eating here. Yeah, exactly. I don't want to eat them. Exactly. <laughs> what, what is your favorite like cheat meal? You said wings. Like, what after a fight? Is there a, like a certain thing that you just love to eat? Uh, just steak. Like I'm steak. Yeah, yeah. meat. I, I'm like I'm full carnivore pretty much. And what do you hunt? Like, what is like? I guess deer. Like, what? Like, what's your favorite meat? What do you like? Bear. Bear. Yeah. No way. Yeah. At least Any I'm... crazy stories with that? Like a bear? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> no I, killed, I killed like one of the biggest bears ever shot in Cape Breton. More yeah, it's on my Instagram. If you find it, there's a picture of it on there. And how big was this? Like we're talking. About? Oh, it was massive. It was like, <laughs> it was absolutely massive. Like, it was a black bear. But I, when I when I brought, so to me, I just eat for the meat. Like I don't really care about trophies. But because this was like the first bear I'd ever actually shot, um, I wanted to get the the rug done. Yeah, for sure. Right? Yeah, I wanted for sure. to have something to save. So first and foremost, I I butchered it. I used all the fat, rendered it down for cooking oil. Then I cut up all the meat, back and sealed it, roast, steak, everything, all that. And then uh, I took the hide into uh, the Valley Taxidermy in, in Nova Scotia. And when I brought it into him, he couldn't believe it. He's like, I gotta show you something. And he showed me a grizzly bear that someone had brought into yeah. town that they shot in, over in Alaska or someplace, right? And my bear was the same size as a grizzly bear, a black bear. And black bears are not, they're supposed to be small. So you got like the big beast. He was a monster. <laughs> this bear was eating other bears. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. There's no way. I was gonna say now as well, like um like how do you deal with like say like setbacks or just like a setback like after like say after your rebus, you say your first loss, like how did you how do you deal with setbacks? Is um, it even a setback we just think about like the next fight on? You know what I think this is when I go back into my mentality from the streets because the I had about two hundred, two hundred plus, two hundred no more than two hundred and fifty, no less than two hundred street fights. And I got the scars to prove it and you know, it's, it's this, nothing new. this really happened. So, and if those fights, let me tell you, I didn't win them all. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's like, no, there's nothing new to you. No, so I go back there and it was like, you know, if I got beat up on a Saturday night, but next Saturday, I'm right back looking for those guys. Right back again. Yeah, like, I'm looking for the guys who beat me up. So it's like boxing, I, I, if, before I get too low on a loss, I just remember like, you know, it's just a fight game. You know, you're gonna win some, you're gonna lose some. Exactly, and then the worst you injury is it from that fight? Cause I seen like, off, like, was it from the Rebus fight? There, like, you're in a hospital bed, like all like, like oh, all, but you're happy. happy. You're still on the hype, cause you're like, what's it called? Like, is there like a sort of in? Like, did you? What, is that the worst that happened to you basically no, after a fight? No, no. Uh, after a fight or boxing fight? After like a boxing fight. After a boxing fight, um, the Rebus was a rough one. Like Steve, you tell you his story. Right. Uh, if he, if he, if he's ever interviewed about it, so he was the only one that was. 
was the on the hospital trip there. People see me at the af afterwards. Yeah. But um, on the way to the, to the hospital, it was some scary moments. Like my, my I was having kidney failure. My brain was swollen. So that's like. Oh yeah, like there was debate about like taking off a piece of my skull. I'm pretty sure because my brain was completely swollen. Like, oh yeah, and and uh, my muscles were shutting down. They had to give me morphine to like even get an IV in me because my body was like convulsing and stuff. I don't remember any of this. Yeah, either. exactly. Wow, no. that's incredible. When I started coming around at like Stevie, I just remember the first thing I remember after that fight. I remember leaving the ring, and then I remember being in the dressing room. I remember I actually remember Arthur Vetterby being in my dressing room telling me how of a warrior I was. You Menace, know? yeah, crazy. And uh, and the next thing you know, I was just like waking up and uh, Stevie had his hand on my shoulder and I was just like, whoa, yeah, like, what's going cool. on? Right? And IV was like, there was blood everywhere because they couldn't get the IV in because like my body was convulsing and stuff. And then he's just like, you're good, buddy, you're going to be good. And I was like, all right, I thought I was gone there for a minute, but this happened a couple times wow. after fights. It happened after uh, the Peralta fight, I had a seizure and all this stuff. Fighting. Oh yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Is it because of the shots to the head? Shots to the head, swollen brain, no oxygen is getting to your brain. Yeah, yeah. My career was supposed to be over multiple times. And now you're here. They don't call you the bruiser for a reason. No, I just keep getting, I honestly keep getting stronger. Like, the more I get hit, I seem like the more weedy I actually get. It's like the opposite. The modern day Jack Dempsey. <laughs> this is incredible. I'll say, how do you, uh, how do you handle like the pressure, the expectation of being just like a professional boxer and athlete? Uh, you know, it's just, Although I, I'm a professional now, I have to kind of carry myself a little bit differently, but I, I just see it like I'm a modern day gladiator, you know. If you put me 2,000 years ago, I would be in a coliseum with a sword fighting a lion. I really would, you yeah. know. If it was 100 years ago, I was Jack Dempsey, you know. 50 years before that, I was John L. Sullivan, you know. 100 years from now, when I'm long gone dead, I'm fighting robots. <laughs> you're, you're made for this for sure. Yeah. What goes through your mind, like just before the fight? Like, say, like, right to like, right, like, you're just about to go right through the, just into the ring. What goes through your mind? I'm gonna kill this man and, and I'm ready to die or something. So, you don't get that nerves or jitters, or obviously, you don't get nerves, but you really get that, like, mentality, like, it's done. Two, two weeks before the fight, you start feeling it. Today in the gym, I was having a nervous breakdown. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah and Stevie were like, Dad, give me a talk before training because, like, yeah. I'm human two weeks before the fight, but, like, once, once the fight day comes, I'm not even there. And the weigh-ins and stuff. I've accepted everything that's gonna happen. I'm like, you know what? There's no other way to die than do it right here in the middle of the ring. Crazy. Mm -hmm. where, where, where's your favorite uh, like place to fight at? Is it back home in Nova Scotia? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say it's in Cape Breton. My oh. my favorite place to fight is Cape Breton. The like where I grow up, like it's it's a different kind of area. People there are just um, fighting life for a lot of people. That's all people talk about. You go to a bar, like they're looking at your knuckles to exactly. make sure that you're hard. And, you know, when somebody shakes your hand, they're looking at your hands to oh, see how many fights you've been in. Look, they're looking at your face, how many scars you've got. Nobody cares how much money you have. Exactly. Nobody cares what you drive. Nobody well, cares if you, what you have enough balls, basically. Yeah, they <laughs> want to know yeah, if, you're, if you're a fighter or not. Uh, so how how keep Britain and stuff? Like, what's the population? Is it quite big or everybody knows everybody? Everyone knows everybody. So when you go there, you're top of for sure. Yeah. Yeah, they, know, they know you for sure. It's better good or bad. I've, yeah. always, I've always been known for something. Exactly. I'm going to say, now, what is it like? Is, is there a dream location for you? Like, is there like... See if you could just dream out there, like what probably Vegas to fight basically, because the championship fight. Where would you actually think that would be if you could it surpass on Saturday? You know what? If I if I can pick where it is, I would say I would love for it to be Madison Square Garden, definitely. It's the mecca. Yeah. Wow, yeah. that'll be some iconic stuff. Now, your favorite fighters besides Jack Dempsey, who are your favorite fighters growing up? You just said Sullivan, some names right there. Um, so I got, I, I like that David Benavidez right now. You know, he's a, he's a modern day fighter. Obviously, Jack Dempsey. Rocky Marciano, Sonny Liston is one of my favorites. I like the mean fighters. Yeah, you like the, I can tell you, the, the, you like the old school fighters as well. Yeah. They show like, the more character and stuff for sure. Well, yeah, they were they were more, you know, greedy and stuff. Um, like, you do have a few today. I like a Canadian fighter, uh, David Lemieux. My buddy Brandon Brewer is one of my favorite fighters too growing up. Wow. Yeah, I love watching Brandon fight. Um, just a rough, rough guy. He, uh, you know, he, he's to the death, Joe. If you put you put him in a fight, he's gonna go to the death. That's his last breath. Yeah. <laughs> Incredible. Now I wanna talk back now as well, um, that you signed obviously with three lines and stuff. Like was that like basically like was that like one of those like is that like a pinnacle for you? Like you got signed professionally? Yeah, that was that was huge. Like and you know, I never in a million years did I think that was gonna happen. And then uh, you know, it happened and then a huge goal of mine, once I actually started getting into the pros, once I started winning and stuff, like 
I didn't have much confidence in boxing. I didn't think that I was going to do anything special in the beginning. I wasn't claiming I was going to be world champion. I just was claiming that I was going to be a prize fighter. That's yeah. what I cared about, just being a prize fighter. And uh, my dad, I don't remember this, but he says that my goal was to win 10 in a row. I was like, once I get to 10 and 0, I don't care if I lose my next 30. Yeah. I just want to win 10 in a row. It's a bucket list. Yeah, because in the amateurs, I was losing like three, win one, lose two, win one, right? So, uh, but once I had gotten signed with uh, Three Lions Promotions, I remember they asked me, like, what's your goals? And I was like, well, you know, one day I'd love to like challenge for the Canadian title, Cruiserweight Canadian title. And uh, next thing you know, they got me. That was my first fight signed with them. I fought a guy, a Vulcan Boxby. And uh, he was 8-0 at the time, undefeated, and he was supposed to be the next big thing to come into Canada. And I was 7-0 and at the time, 7 knockouts. And uh, I, I fought him for the first, it was a main event, it was in Hamilton, and that was my first fight signed with him. And this guy talked so much garbage. I can imagine. Absolute garbage. He, he was saying things like, I was just delusional, think I was ever even going to get this far, blah, blah, blah. Anyways, he talked himself into his own grave. Good. Yeah. And I, <laughs> I, I, for talking. <laughs> I wasn't saying it to in front of a camera or nothing, but I would anybody was talking to me like I was saying I'm gonna end his career. Like he doesn't realize that everything he's saying is like he's digging his own grave because he's yeah. really pissing me off. And I was like, when I see the opportunity, I'm gonna hit him. I'm gonna change his life, and I did. <laughs> Later on, there you go. He never he he was never the same guy after I knocked him out. And I gotta say on the uh, on the Oscar Rivas fight as well. I've read into it and stuff that he was way heavier than you were. Mm -hmm. Now, how'd you like take that fight? Like, I just put it in my head that I was Jack Dempsey and he was Jess Willard. Like, uh, when Jack Dempsey fought Willard, he gave up like 45 pounds, 45, 50 pounds. What'd you give up for this fight? Uh, against Rebus? Well, you had, you had to gain him, right? I had to gain to get over 200 pounds. So, I came into that fight after weigh ins, I think. So, he cut weight to get to 225. And uh, after weigh ins, he rehydrated to probably, I don't know, but. Probably 245, 250. He looked very like just yeah, he's still yeah, yeah. And I went back down to 192. So I gave him probably 50 pounds in that fight. Wow, incredible. Yeah. So I was gonna say, now, how was it growing up in uh, Cape Breton? Uh, it was it's rough. Like you, you got to, uh, you know, back then I had to, I had to work growing up. So for me, I grew up um, on my grandfather's farm for the most part. Well, I started in a trailer court. I went from the trailer court to the farm, and then once I got on the farm, it was like my job was to get the wood in the basement for the winter, fill up the shacks for the winter, and like cut hardwood, and it's cold. Exactly, so some real starting from the bottom type of stuff. Yeah, like, yeah. I was cutting wood for you know 365 days a year when I was 11 years old. Wow, yeah. this is incredible. Now I was gonna say, what do you see yourself accomplishing now, like in the next, let's say, two to five years? Um, I, th I think, um, you know, if I can get that world title, like I'm so close, really I'm two punches away, 100%. you know, it's right there, and then, you know, hey, but anything can happen. Like, I could lose Saturday night, and I'm back down to the bottom of the ladder here. So, I don't want to get ahead of myself. I don't want to look past Saturday. But let's say if I do pull it off and I knock him out, um, I would like to get that world title in a, you know, in a, in a high hopes world. I would like to get that world title, and I would like to knock out every man that that uh, stands in the way or comes and challenges for it. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. I was say, do you think boxing gets that like respect from other sports? Do you think boxing gets the respect that it deserves? I think it's starting to. I yeah. think, um, you know, I think these YouTube guys and these celebrities like messing around and playing around in there and, and uh, you know, manipulating the, the public. I think that kind of gave it a little bit of a bad name. Um, but I think that, I think boxing needs somebody like me to, to and I'm not trying to, you know, sound arrogant or, you know, egotistical or anything, but I really believe that boxing needs someone like me to basically show the world that this is a, this is like the modern day gladiators. This, this, this is how they're supposed to be. Like, yeah. I know MMA is brutal too. Guys yeah. get their arms snapped and stuff, but boxing there's more depth. Yeah. But if you if you want to if you want to risk your life in, in uh, combat sports, go to professional boxing. And I and I don't mean celebrity YouTube, yeah. uh, you know, influencers and nonsense stuff. Yeah. stuff. I'm yeah. talking real prize fighting. You know, you, you look in club cards, guys die all the time. Because it's just pure trauma to the head. Yeah. You're, you're not in there, like, there's no way you can hold and get a break. You can't go to the ground and take a breather. And I'm not knocking MMA, because yeah. that's just as brutal, if not more brutal in its own way. But box, it's always right to the, like, to the head. You're taking, yeah. it's just nonstop punishment to the brain, to the body, to the organs. So like, there's nowhere to go. You, you, get, you get dropped and knocked out, you're back on your feet, there's a referee going to say, Box and this guy's coming to kill you again right away. Uh, right oh, away, like, there's nowhere to go. Yeah, exactly. You know? 
so so your life is on the line every time you get in there. It's the it's the closest thing you can get to like mod, modern day gladiators in a coliseum fighting. So and I think that the world needs to be reminded of that. And that's what I think I'm here for. Exactly. You know? I was gonna say, is there any like you're just saying reminding them, is there any like advice for like upcoming fighters that look at you just in general, just be like, wow, like like they like the path that as a boxer, professional boxer, like you're going to, and they just look at you and stuff, like the youngins that just wanna need advice. Any advice for the future? You know what I couldn't give any advice to the, except for the kids that are coming out of freaking juvies and come and stuff like that. Like yeah, drills against him. I think that the the the, ath the athletes because I'm not I don't look at myself like an athlete. I look at myself like a boxer. I'm like that fighter that got saved by boxing. If it wasn't for boxing, I would have been dead long ago. My whole goal in life was to once I found out that I was a fighter. Once I once I learned that this is like the only thing in life I wanted to do, I was a fighter to the death even before I knew what boxing was. You know what I mean? It's just nobody could get me there. Yeah, exactly. Nobody could get me there in the street. So, so I started boxing to challenge tougher people to get me there. And then, uh, so yeah, so if I got to give advice to these, like, number one, if, you, if, you're, if you're not willing to die, don't do it. If you're not willing to die or kill in a fight, go do something else. Exactly. Go do something else. Like, <laughs> I think that the, the ones, the fighters that should look up to me or the young kids coming up that should look up to me are the ones coming to the juvies. They're the ones who found boxing. And then you can still do something with your life. Yeah, and yeah. then it can turn violence into something like actually beautiful. Like really, like it's like I took this like violence that was going to get me killed or kill people in the streets, and I put it into like something to make money and, and uh, inspire other people like me. You know what I mean? Can I've said it better there? What is the like most valuable lesson that boxing taught you? Control, be control, because like. You know, even, like people piss me off. There's no question. About it. Like, you know, people, we live in such a weird world where, where people are just weird and they they, they, they want to like say anything push, stupid. Yeah. They want to just push their stupid beliefs onto everybody. Yeah. And if you don't believe, you're you're automatically like you're either a freaking hater or a racist or you're this or, or something. You're, you're something. Something stupid, right? And like these type of people, like if it wasn't for boxing and they approach me and not not on this stuff. In yeah, real life, real I would smash their I can imagine, I'd yeah. smash their They're just they were basically tough guys behind the, the, the yeah. screen. Yeah, that's what, what, what boxing taught me is like, you know, you could have someone come in right now and they could just like completely slander me and go on and this and that. And I'll just be like, yeah, well, I gotta go train. I gotta go train. I'm gonna stuff to do. Yeah, exactly. You know, I got something to prove here a little bit bigger than what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> but if it wasn't for boxing, yeah. it's like they can't even step into your shoes for not even a second. No, but that's okay. You just, you, you gotta kind of humble yourself and, 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 and realize that. And, and also, it, it's like, once you have this ability, like, it's like not to sound arrogant or nothing, but it's like taking candy from a baby, and it's like, they don't know. They don't know exactly. It's like when a little kid comes up to you, like a small little child, right, and they punch you. You're not just going to smash the kid. Exactly. They don't know what, they don't know. They don't know. They're just a kid. kid. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, what, what keeps you motivated? To, to all that. All that, exactly. <laughs> all that. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> I was gonna say now let's do this now let's run up the uh, the MGM recently did their top ten best boxers of all time I want to run through ten to one mm -hmm. and let's see if you agree or whatever like say if you want to switch whatever one of them so top ten at number ten they have Willie Pep mm -hmm. at number ten Will of the Wisp yeah, yeah at number nine they have Henry Armstrong yeah at number eight they have Roberto Duran number seven they have your favorite Jack Dempsey yeah and at number six they have Manny Pacquiao. Now it's getting a little more new school. They have yeah. number five, they have Mayweather. Mm -hmm. And then number four, they have Rocky Marciano, sorry. And then yeah. number three, they have Sugar Ray. Number two, they have Joe Lewis. And number one, they have Muhammad Ali. I knew they were going to put Ali number one. Yeah. I don't know. They have Muhammad Ali as number one. Like, I, in my opinion, it's like, I get like he was like, it's Muhammad Ali, right? It's like he is. But I don't know. I think that they might have been better boss than Muhammad Ali. It's just that time, that time frame or whatever, I'm guessing. Hey, this is the thing here. All these fighters all had promoters. They all had uh, writers. They all had media behind them. There's fighters out there. I'll tell you, right? You can look at it and you can look on your computer right now. Sugar Ray Robinson, for example. They got him number three. Uh, Sugar Ray's number three, yeah. So... Sugar Ray Robinson fight a fighter in his prime uh, by the now, by the name of Ralph Tiger Jones, who was actually a police officer who who had a record of like maybe thirty some wins, twenty some losses. It's supposed to be an easy night for Ray Robinson. Ralph Tiger Jones beat him from pillar to post. Easy work for him. But they don't talk about that. They don't talk about that guy though. Uh, okay. And then once and then Ray Robinson lost. Like this guy beat him. One of his losses on his record. And then Ray Robinson went on, won the middleweight championship of the world from Jake Lamada. 
and would never give uh, Ralph Tiger Jones a return fight. But you've never heard of Ralph Tiger Jones. Exactly. Nobody did. Wow. So that list is all the people who have the media behind them. Exactly. It's very, it's very political. Boxing's huge. Boxing's yeah. all politics. Yeah, that, that's what I mean. It's like, especially last fight as well, the when it was a fury against, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, from the UFC. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Francis? Nibano. Yeah. Nibano? Like, I don't know. Yeah. It, very, it just seems very political. Like, it's like, I don't, I don't understand. Fury lost that fight. Yeah, like, it, there's, no, there's no way. It just seems very political. Yeah. Like, have you ever seen, like, any fight? Well, obviously, you knock everybody out. Like, like yeah. one fight, that was just like, how? Like, my one of my fights, I fought uh, my one decision win should be a loss on my record. Wow. Yeah, and These I said, are honest. Wow. Yeah, I don't care. It's, yeah. Like I said, it's win or lose. I don't. Yeah. I could get knocked out in this fight Saturday, and um, whatever, different yeah. fight, you know. But um, yeah, like I, I fought that fight, and I thought he beat me. Like, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of people who think I won because I roughed him up. I made it dirty. I uh, I pushed the fight, but at the end of the day, I thought he like outscored me, outboxed me. I was a I was bruiser from bell to bell. I was just trying to kill him. And yeah. he he, uh, he was like the bull and I was or I was the bull, he was the madler kind of thing. So I thought he, you know, he applied his game plan better. He outboxed me. Uh, my whole thing was to put him on the floor and I didn't do it. I was looking to do it. So for me I lost the fight. Wow. And then I got the fight because at the end of the day it was in my hometown, my promoters my promoters, judges, everything. So you think there's always a little extra push? Of course, I was there. I experienced both sides of it. Also, the Rebus fight. Yeah. I, I, seen, I seen that Rebus, so there's no way. Like, you were like, that was a slugfest, but you showed a heart. You were going at it. I thought you were I going at it. Fight. Yeah. I thought I lost the one I won, and yeah. I thought I won the one I lost. My two decisions on that. Now, if you won Rebus, do you think it would have been like a, what, what, like a whole different, like... Um, oh, my, my path would have been completely different. But you know what? At the end of the day, like... Um, like I said, I was a fan of Rebus, and um, I was happy for him. I'll never forget, when I, when they announced that decision, my heart was like, oh, man, damn, I came this close this to winning close. the world title. Like, I was almost champion of the world. That's something you actually like, yeah. But at okay. the same time, as soon as I just accepted it, and I remember, like, walking like like walking towards Stevie. Right. He was yeah. holding the ropes. So this is one of my last memories before, like, the hospital. And, like, I just remember, like, looking back in the ring and seeing Rebus with the belt, and he was beat. Don't, like, yeah, he was oh, for beat, sure, right? yeah. And I knew he was never gonna fight again. I knew right there. And I didn't know if I was ever gonna fight again yeah. because it was one of those fights where you I guys let it all out. We were both like just beaten, you know? Like we, we, we were both to the death in that. And he probably felt the easy walk in the park for sure. Oh, for sure he did. He's yeah. like, what's going on here yeah. for sure? <laughs> but you know what? Like I was happy for him. Yeah. Because uh, I knew his story and I knew like he was involved in the in the politics thing, like where they would never give him a shot. Tyson Fury wanted nothing to do with that guy. Wilder wanted nothing to do. Like nobody wanted to fight him. You're in there, you stepped in there. Wow, yeah. Incredible. But they but they wouldn't he wasn't gonna get that shot. You know what I mean? And then finally he got it and he won. And of course, I like had it, I just took myself out of it and yeah. I was like, damn, good for him. Like he got that freaking fight, you know? And then I left and that was that. Like two warriors going at it. I think you show respect. Yeah. But what is your what your personal we're about to wrap this up very soon. Now your personal goals in boxing. To become world champion, that's the goal? It is right now. Like I said, when I first started, it was just be a prize fighter, you know. Right now, because the world title's right there, it kind of has to be my has goal. It has to be, has to be. has to be my goal. If, I, if it's not, then I'm not going to get it. So I have to focus on that right now. So right now, it's getting that world title. Um, but currently, Duragola, the first round. That's, that's your Saturday goal for night. sure. We're talking an hour <laughs> away, right? Exactly. How important yeah. is legacy to you? Oh, it's huge. Yeah. It's huge. And like I said, I, I think that my whole purpose here is to, to show the world what uh, what a prize fighter really is. Not a, not a YouTuber. Not no, somebody who An pretends. actual fighter. I mean a fighter who boxing exactly. literally saved them, took them from took them from nothing and made them something. And, and that's what I'm here for. That's good. That's why we're here to hear this story. Incredible. Now, I'm going to say as well, like, what does the sport of boxing like mean to you? We all know it saved your life, literally. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to you, boxing? It, it's like boxing's like a gift for people you know it's like um like i said people like me who are growing up and they're, they're, they were on this one-way track to self-destruction like if it wasn't for boxing it boxing's like a god let's put it that way it's like a religion savior for you it's a savior it's like um i, I thank every day i thank boxing every day i thank boxing and jack dempsey because if it wasn't for those two things i wouldn't be here like in the very beginning there's many other things there's many other people i'd have to thank and stuff like that but those are the roots, you know what I, I mean? got you where you are right now. For sure. Incredible. What do you see yourself doing after boxing? 
Damn, I don't know. <laughs> but overall, like so maybe like to train, would you would you like to go like step in like how uh, Stevie is? Would you like to train or? I mean, no, I would never be able to train. Nah, but it was like Stevie's like, <laughs> like let's go get very ruthless. Don't get scared. But like, no, one day, one day, I definitely like to uh, open up a gym back home in Cape Breton, and because that that gym that I started and saved a lot of people like me. It's a rough place, like I said, and uh, a lot of uh, a lot of kids coming up there are going down a one way track to. Uh, you know, similar uh, paths, yeah. Similar path, and and there's no gym right now that's like a place for them to go. So I think I, I think once it's all said and done, if I make it out of this alive, then I I'll uh, I'll probably you know reopen the old club, yeah. Uh, and just name it after you or somewhere, yeah. Uh, you, maybe just the original name. Original name, yeah. yeah. Well, okay. Yeah. Now, when it's all set and done, what do you want the fans to remember Ryan Rizicki as? Um, the most violent fighter that ever lived. And I've said it better. Guys, this Saturday, it's live from Sydney, Nova Scotia. The bruiser, Ryan Riziki, right here versus Duradola. It's going to be an absolute. I hope it's going to be a one, uh, one round knockout for I you. I hope so. It, it, it could be a 12 round war. We'll Who see. knows, guys? If you go either way, guys, yeah. thanks for tuning in live. It's Johnny I Pro Show with WBC's ranked number one. Watch him live this Saturday. See you later. Good. Good. Thank you. That was perfection. That was fucking really, really fucking awesome, bro. Holy oh, yeah. shit. Yeah, man. You Are you native, bro? Yeah, but, but native, is it? Let's say that. No. My cousin's native, but not me. Okay, so we're going to save it.